Hello everyone and welcome to Saturday, August 2nd. This is the Classroom 2.0 Live show and today's topic is Unleashing Student Superpowers. I'm one of the show co-hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for doing the closed captioning each week. Our special guests are Kristen Swanson and Hadley Ferguson. The show's live binder is at this link here. And notice that the individual part to the binder, the tabs are on the left column rather than across the top. Uh, Peggy put the link for the live binder in the chat. Uh, once the presentation starts, I will be capturing questions from the chat. All shows are recorded and the recordings are posted at this link on the archives and resources page. This is where we start getting interactive with the session. You can choose one of those laser pointers and show us where in the world you're logging in from. I'm from central Pennsylvania. I know Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. I'm not sure where Hadley and Kristen are logging in from. We can also type in the chat. We've got Serbia, San Francisco. Uh, you get, can't get the laser pointer if you're on an iPad, Beth. It's not one of the options. From Philadelphia, Indianapolis, Arkansas, southern New Jersey. We usually have a worldwide audience, so we still do. Here's our first poll question. Again, you vote with the tool underneath your name in bold at the top. Are you using project-based learning in your classroom? Uh, the choices that are on this whiteboard slide will not work. You, you can also type in the chat. Give you a chance to vote and then post the responses. Out of those that voted, 21% aren't and 26% are. The next question after I clear the first set of answers, are you willing to try new things this year? Even on an iPad, I think you've got the polling. It's underneath your name at the top. Again, I'll give you a chance to vote and then post those. Out of those that voted, 65% said yes. And the third polling question, do you have superpowers? Can I give you a chance to vote? And then I'm going to post those. Out of those that voted, 57% said yes, 15% said no. Um, we'll get to that again soon, Karen, as far as the live binder link. Again, welcome to this Saturday's session for Classroom 2.0 Live. Our topic is Unleashing Student Superpowers. Um, I'm Lori Moffitt. 
Peggy George is also a co-host, as well as Tammy Moore. Our special guests are Kristen Swanson and Hadley Ferguson. Dr. Christian Swanson is a senior educational research leader at Bright Bites, adjunct Masters of Education professor for DeSales University, a Google certified teacher, an Ed Camper, uh, an Ed Camp founding board member, a TEDx Philly Ed speaker, uh, Keystone's tech integrator, teacher, learner, and author of Professional Learning in the Digital Age, Teaching and the Speaking and Listening Standards, and Unleashing Student Superpowers. Hadley Ferguson is a middle school teacher at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, an independent school in Philadelphia. She was named a Teacher of the Future by NAIS in 2013 and is a member of the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources Mentor Advisory Board. She is also a founding board member of the EdCamp Foundation, dedicated to spreading the EdCamp format of professional development for teachers. She has presented at a variety of conferences, including ISTE, National Middle School Association, Educational Computing Conference of Ontario, and EDUCON. Her latest presentation is on being a risk-taking teacher based on her work with ungrading. Her blog, Middle School Matrix, explores the challenges of teaching middle school in a digital world. So the newbie question is, what is a superpower in the 21st century? And I'm going to turn the mic over to Hadley to answer this question to begin the presentation. Welcome to everybody. Um, we have been thinking about superpowers, and many of them we've looked at skills that students have needed to have previous to the 21st century, but that moving into this century, there are many things that our students need as digital citizens that we haven't uh, trained them for before. And so the purpose of the book was to empower those students to move into the 21st century. Kristen, you want to add to that? I'm wondering if Kristen is frozen because she has a bandwidth lag there. Oh, and, I see. Uh, yeah, and her chat seems to be frozen, so um, she might not even be hearing us. Okay, okay. So well, why then, don't you carry on, and maybe she can check in in a minute. Okay, that sounds good. Sorry, um, I uh, I lost all audio there for a second, but I think I'm back. You oh, are back. Awesome. Terrific, Kristen. Right. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, so we were talking, Kristen, about 21st century um, superpowers. And I was saying that while some of them are based on ones that came from 20th century skills, there are ones that as students are becoming digital citizens and global citizens that they needed to add to their toolbox. Exactly. And, you know, I think that really sort of the impetus for this work and the impetus for this line of thinking is that when I think about the skills and the, um, the tendency that students will need to be really successful in a world where global competition is the norm, it's all about empowerment. Um, and it's about empowerment for us as teachers. It's about empowerment for students as learners. And we really wanted to think through the practical ways that you could bring this level of empowerment to all facets of your classroom. So I think that the first thing that we all need to recognize for um, really effective student-driven instruction is that as educators, we all have superpowers. And all of our students have superpowers as well. Um, and really what we wanted to do was we wanted to really highlight the specific superpowers that we felt were somewhat unique to the challenges that students will face in the 21st century. Um, and so we're going to kind of share with you a little bit about each of these superpowers. You can see each of the superpowers there um, on the slide. 
and just let you know a little bit more about how we use them in our classrooms and um, hopefully point you to some practical things that you can start using tomorrow as you roll out your classroom this coming fall to really empower yourself, empower your kids, and think through all of the um, implications that that might have. And, you know, I see the question in the chat, how did you kind of come up with this term superpowers? Well, I think this term really came from um, this idea, you know, Hadley and I were actually at, um, we were sitting at a table together probably about two years ago now, and I told her that I was working on these units for student-driven instruction, and she just looked at me and she was like, this is, this is like superpowers. This is like giving, you know, making our kids into superheroes, and we just don't do that enough. We don't put them in the driver's seat enough, and, and it was sort of born from there, which was really exciting. And I think that one of the things that we're sort of hoping with all of this is that teachers will also get the sense that they have new powers um, that aren't about um, being more powerful necessarily in the front of the classroom, but being more um, engaged with their students on, in a whole new variety of ways. It's really about the changing role that we face in this new world, which is so exciting and can be a little bit scary, but I choose to think of it as something that gives us an opportunity that we've absolutely never had before. So we're going to start with sort of the fundamental assumption that, you know, sort of guides every decision that we've made in creating both the superpowers as well as creating um, all of the all of the units and the, the practical strategies. And that is that the person who is doing the work is doing the learning. So if in a traditional classroom, if you really think about it, if students are sitting in rows or, as the picture suggests, sort of gathered there around the chalkboard, and they're just passively absorbing, they're not really doing the most learning. The teacher is the one doing most of the learning. And so we really wanted to flip this on its head and say, you know, how do we actually put the work and put the decisions in the hands of the students? And we are simply there as a coach or as a guide as needed so that they really become more confident in their abilities to, to make change in the world. So the image that we came up with here, this is the Lego version of Professor X. And it was really thinking about how in X-Men, Professor X goes out and identifies students with, who are unique. And he takes them through a series of challenges and unleashes what is inside of them so that they can be the best that they, they could possibly be. And that was the image that we had of beginning to take students and let them be the ones with power in the classroom and take them out of, of a role where they're passive and they're waiting to be told what to do, they're waiting to be told what are the important things, and they begin to be the ones driving the, their own learning. And we just saw that as a really powerful way for them to become the best that they could be. And so that when you look at a classroom of students, you're not looking at, you're trying to get this group to a certain point, but you're rather trying to take, take each student in that place and help them to recognize what their strengths are, what their challenges are, and to move them to a place where they feel control over their learning rather than it being about them thinking about the teacher in the front of the room and trying to figure out the game of school. That we want to leave behind that place where it's about how do I get the A from this teacher and more about how do I study this, how do I learn it, how do I integrate it into who I am as a learner. And we began to see that as something where those would be powers that they took on and that as we could help teachers walk through each, um, each of these powers with their students, the students by the end of each chapter would have gained new skills. And so we set the book up so that each of these powers, there are four lesson plans that are written out so you don't have to figure out, the teacher doesn't have to figure out how am I going to teach the wondering superpower. There are four distinct lesson plans to help them on this instructional journey, we call it, because we really see the process as one of a journey, that students are moving from a place where they barely have this power to one where they feel totally empowered to use it both in individual classrooms but across the board. And so we have the lesson plans, we have the assessment tools, 
um, all written there so that teachers can see how to implement that. And then there's a fictionalized account at the end of the chapter of what it would actually feel like to be teaching this lesson, to, to give the teachers as much as possible to help them walk through this without it becoming too challenging for them. Um, and so we've looked at um, a wondering, connecting, curating, gaming, digital linking, and designing as the, the, the skills that we want to add um, into their learning these days. And so if you're sort of familiar with the competency movement, um, you can almost think of these superpowers as a set of competencies that are specifically geared towards 21st century learning. Um, and the first is wondering. And this superpower actually came out of some of the work um, that comes out of Project Zero, where if you, if you read some of the work that they've done, you know, you can, you can hear the stories that come over and over again that, you know, once um, some of these folks actually got into the real world, they didn't struggle to find answers. They struggled to find the right questions to help them get to their problems. Um, and so we actually think that, you know, this wondering superpower is about asking critical questions, gathering the information, and determining how relevant they are. But I'd love to throw a question out to the chat if you want to take a few moments here. Um, what are some of the ways that you are already using questioning strategically in your classrooms? Maybe you're using essential questions. Maybe you're having student-generated questions. I'd love to just throw it out to the chat for a moment or so. How are you using questioning very strategically already in your classroom? So I can see as folks are starting to put in the chat there that lots of people are using this idea of an essential question or a big question. Um, how many of you, and we'll just put this as a, as a vote here, um, how many of you, and you can just type yes or no into the chat, are um, asking students to generate those questions? So I see some, I see sometimes, I see no, um, and so I think that this is a really practical thing that we can look at as far as giving kids superpowers, is putting more of the question generation process into their hands um, and saying to them, what is it that you want to know? Uh, I was talking with an educator on Thursday, and she shared with me that she took her entire class out to this beautiful uh, nature walk area. And when she took her class out there, she asked them, they were kindergartners, I, I want you to think of as many questions as you can and we'll pick the most interesting question and we'll explore it for a few weeks in class. Well, she thought, of course, that they were going to ask questions about the flora, about the fauna, about, you know, animals that might be living there. But of course, these five-year-olds decided that it was absolutely fascinating to look at the sewer that happened to be along this park. And so after asking lots of questions about the sewer, they spent two to three weeks studying sewers um, and studying how they worked and why they worked and why they were important. Um, and the students were so uh, interested in this that it was a really successful uh, nonfiction text engagement. And it really made me think, you know, how often do we think we know what kids are going to ask before we even ask them? And so how can we actually really put that ball in their court and sort of let them um, you know, kind of drive the bus when it comes to question generation. The next uh, superpower that we looked at is curating because we realized that students in today's world live in the world of Google. They live in the world of YouTube and they are surrounded by information and trying to give them the power to take control over that and to recognize, first of all, what's what's important, what's true, and then what do I do with all of this stuff? So that once they've found something that's worth holding on to, they can begin to categorize it, they can begin to build um, ways to hold on to this information so they're not constantly doing the next Google search. Um, I'd be interested in the chat to know which, uh, what tools you all use for your cur curation. 
Um, how is it that you hold on to websites? Do you have special tools that you use? Because I think most of us as adults have, have realized that we need to come up with a way to organize all the information that we have. And what I, what I find is the challenge is that I end up filing it, bookmarking it, um, pinning it, and then I forget that it's there. And so trying to teach kids ways to build categories within the large, I've got, you know, I've got a board on ancient Egypt that has 7,000 things on it, but I can't find anything within it because I've put so much up there. And so I think that it's a really important job for us to walk kids through recognizing, figuring out what's important, figuring out is it true, and then how are they going to build categories that make sense to them, not categories that necessarily are imposed, which is sort of the old model of the teacher telling them how to organize, but helping them to figure out how, what are the categories that they want as students and that they're going to need as students, and then helping them to weed through that, to figure out what, once I have all of this, what am I going to do with it, and how am I going to make it have meaning rather than just be a giant amount of clutter. And that's an ongoing process, and so teaching students how to find what's important, how to categorize it, and then how to build something new from that are important skills for our students to have moving forward. Um, I didn't, I haven't looked. Yes, EduCorporate, definitely. Um, and tagging is also a very big part of it. Um, I think that teaching students to effectively tag when they're um, on something like Edmodo is a really in, um, important skill for them to learn. Um, the next skill that, the next superpower that we, are, before I move on to, to um, connecting, are there any curating um, comments or skills or, uh, that people want to add in before I move on? Okay. Um, so connecting is also a, um, a really important skill that has to start in the classroom, and this is the building of learning to tell your own story and then learning to, to listen to the stories of others and to develop empathy so that you can begin to create connections between your students, between you and your students, and then the next step in the digital age is that they begin to learn how to express themselves so that they can connect with others around the globe. And we see this as just a very important skill to start teaching in elementary school and straight through because these students are going to be um, going out to jobs where they're not just working with people who are sitting across the desk from them, but they're going to be working with people who are around the globe and helping them to understand that how, how to understand other people is an important skill. But they need to be able to tell who they are and then they need to recognize what's important in the, uh, the people that they're hearing from. And when you're hearing from people in, with a written word, sometimes you need to, and, and who's coming from a different culture, you need to recognize that you have to be sensitive, that there are different things that you need to be looking for and paying attention to. Um, and so we wanted students to recognize how to tell their own story, but then how to effectively listen to the stories of other people. All right. And then our third one is digital inking. And I saw earlier in the chat someone said that digital inking was new to them. Um, it's probably not new to you. It's probably just a different word maybe than you've heard before. Um, and really this idea of digital inking is, you know, are we giving kids the opportunity to write for an, on, an, an authentic audience um, where they have the ability to amplify their message through digital tools? Um, and I think that, you know, I've seen this happen as early as, you know, first grade, second grade, even kindergarten classrooms where, you know, teachers are having students write tweets and those tweets are going out over the interwebs and they're getting responses and favorites and, and retweets from people all over the globe. Um, and really the purpose of making sure that digital inking is one of the competencies is because we know that writing is so important. We know that literacy is so important. But we also want to make sure that concept of authentic audience is sort of interwoven into the priorities and superpowers that our students have. 
Um, so I would love to hear from you because I know that we have some rock stars in this chat right now. Um, what are some ways that you are helping students ink digitally? You know, what are some ways that you're giving kids access to authentic audiences, whether it's through blogging or social media or other tools that really give them the ability to amplify their impact and their message with their writing? So I see lots of great ideas. I see blogging. I see hash using the hashtag comments for kids. I see ePals. I see blogging coming through. Um, Google Docs. That's wonderful. Um, and we know that you know potentially some of these tools may be blocked in schools, but I would argue that um, you know. If you look at the pedagogy behind authentic audience and you look at the power and sort of the effect sizes that the research has found with that, um, those can be really powerful tools in communicating with the leadership um, to make sure that you have access to those kinds of things. Um, what I would say with digital inking, you know, what I have sort of found as we've thought through and, and put together some resources on it, is I have found that the, the key piece is ensuring that the authentic audience is in fact real. So I've seen lots of experiences or lots of times where you know, students will write a blog, but it's a blog that you know, no one is looking at or no one is commenting on. Uh, one of my favorite examples of a really good blog that really found a good fit and had a very large audience was, um, if you are familiar with Bill Farader's work, he did a great blog with his kids called Sugar Kills. And what he did with that blog was he actually had students analyze nutrition labels from all different sorts of products that we eat that really have a lot of processed sugar hidden within them, you know, things like Pop-Tarts and toaster strudels and, and all of the kinds of things that kids love to eat. And um, right around the same time, uh, my father was actually diagnosed with diabetes, and I sent him the blog, and he started checking it every day to check out all of the different sugar values that were in all of these foods that, you know, he couldn't eat any longer. Um, and, you know, Bill got a really big following with that, and, and I remember reading some of Bill's reflections on it and uh, how Bill was saying, you know, my kids can't wait to work on this. My kids are coming in at lunch and at recess and after school to work on this because they know that people are counting on the information. Um, and so that's really where we think this idea of digital inking sort of comes through. The designing superpower is one of the ones that really asks students to tackle a real problem and to recognize something that they want to solve and then begin to figure out what are the steps to solving that problem. And so they need to work together. They, it, it's designing happens with, through collaboration and they're going to interview people. They're, um, they're going to be building prototypes. They're going to be assessing and redoing and trying to um, make the best solution to whatever the problem is that they identify. And the goal here is to, once again, give them a sense of power, give them a sense that they can tackle a real problem. Here. Um, it could have to do with the seating in the cafeteria. It could have to do with any problem that they consider authentic and then give them the tools to actually tackle that problem, to begin to, to use real world situations to um, apply what they're doing. So sort of like the blogging about sugar, they're tackling something that they care about and therefore that energizes them to move forward. Um, and it's, it, this, the, um, these lessons are based on the work that was done at the D School out at, uh, out at Stanford and uh, as well as the maker movement that when the kids love to build, they love to create, and the, the goal of these lessons is to give them a chance to actually do some of that in their classrooms. And I don't know um, if any of you have had a chance to use either maker movement or uh, design school thinking in your classrooms, but I'd be interested to hear if you have, because I think that it's an important way um, for kids. Uh, they, love, they, they love to be kinesthetic, they love to build, they love to use. And so even in my history classroom, I try to come up with ways that they can come up with a problem and then try to build a solution for it. Um, 
which all begins around defining that problem and then coming up with solutions. Um, I agree that when we give students a problem, they always come up with awesome solutions. And I think that that is, again, um, when we go back to the beginning, that if they're the ones doing the work, if it's not about the teacher in the front of the classroom doing the work, but it's about the students tackling the problem and doing the work, um, that we support them, we provide them with new tools, we don't expect that they're going to build it from nothing, but at the same time, we give them a sense that there isn't a right answer out there, there isn't an already solution to this problem, but that, that this problem is um, one that they can tackle themselves and come up with their independent um, solutions. One of my favorite ones I've started with, um, if you've seen Kane's Arcade, um, that we, we, the girls in the picture that you're seeing right now, they, we watched the video of Kane's Arcade and then challenged them to create an arcade game themselves. Um, just as a first step in teaching them about collaboration. And they just loved it. They, they love getting involved in it, and they love the, the fact that they're in charge, that there isn't a right answer. And that moving away from right answers, I think, is a really important part of what we're trying to do um, through this book, is to help teachers see that they don't have to always have a right answer, that they can um, empower their students to find answers, and that there are a lot more right answers when you do that. And you know, it was really interesting um, when we were at Educon about a year ago now, we actually had all of the educators in the room design school buses. And you know, we were a little nervous about that because we put a lot of materials in the middle of each table and said, go to it. And it was amazing to see how much ownership and how much fun people were having because it was this kinesthetic creation where they actually had that prototype at the end to hold up um, and really enjoy it. So I think that I think that this can work with all ages, which is is so critical. So the last thing that we're going to talk about uh, is the gaming superpower. And the the reason that this became one of our superpowers, was because we saw the prevalence of games and how successful games were uh, with students of all ages. So right now, almost all students play games at least two to three times a week. That's what Pew Research is telling us. And uh, the, the question is why? Why are these games so addictive? Why are these games so desirable? Why are these games so much fun to kids? And I think when you, when you really get down to it, it's the instant feedback. It's the same reason why when we get a ping on our phone for a text message, it's really hard for us not to look at it and not to check it out because it's that idea of instant feedback in the moment from someone else um, who's, who is sort of grappling with similar problems or similar issues. And, and that's really where we start to see that idea of instant feedback in games becoming really powerful. And so uh, with the gaming superpower, really our intention was to help students create game-like situations uh, for things that you know, they might have to do in their classrooms um, and how they can actually become the game designers. So the gaming superpower isn't so much about playing games as much as it is about looking at games, identifying what makes them fun to play, and then actually developing their own games um, that have really strategic rules. Um, and that's really where the higher order thinking comes in, because I think that everyone in this chat can agree. We've all seen very low level practice games that are just bells and whistles. And, and that's not the intention of the superpower at all. Instead, the intention is to put kids in the driver's seat and allow them to actually create the game. Um, you know, whether it's a low tech type of board game or whether it's sort of the, the game through which, you know, your class may do some sort of learning experience or review, um, and seeing how creative and innovative kids can get as they actually own that creation process. Um, and we have seen that when you actually ask kids to get down to it and analyze what it is that they like about games um, and how can we bring those elements into our schools at times, um, that can also be a really powerful exercise to put kids in the driver's seat regarding you know, their learning and their learning environments in general. But I would love to hear from you guys um, how you're using games right now and if you're having kids design games. 
I saw somebody put in that, you know, games are scaffolded. And I think the important thing about games being scaffolded is also that it's very, very low risk. So when you fail in a game, it's almost expected, especially if you're new to that game. Um, and that, that idea of a, an easy barrier of entry um, and expected failure that can be quickly overcome is really, really important to the success of not only this superpower, but all the superpowers. Um, and ensuring that kids know it's okay not to get it right on the first time. In fact, I expect it, because if you're getting it right on the first try, it's probably too easy for you. Um, and I think that that's really, really an important piece to focus on as well. Um, and there, uh, some, some folks are sharing some really great game creation uh, links and um, I see a great question in here as well. You know, do kids just quit when they lose? No, I think we've all had that experience of playing Candy Crush or 2048 or whatever it might be, where when you lose, the first thing you do is go, I've got to do that again. Um, and what a great way to help students approach learning. So that kind of brings us to the end of all six of the um, superpowers. But now is sort of the, the interactive session where we really want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear what kinds of resources um, you're using. And we'll share our resources as well. Um, so I guess we just want to throw it out to you. How are you using these superpowers already? What are some ideas that you might have as we move forward into this upcoming school year? And how can we help you by providing those resources? While people are composing questions, I'll ask the couple that I managed to catch from chat. And if I can find them again. I thought I had more than just the one. Um, how do you help students think of themselves as designers? Actually, it sounded like that isn't so much of, a, of an issue in most classrooms. But it was a question that came up. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I think it comes along with that similar question that we saw in the, um, in the, uh, in the beginning. How do we help kids? to think of themselves as superheroes. Um, and I think that all of this is about a really powerful paradigm shift. Uh, imagine if going into class on the very first day of learning, instead of hearing, I, you know, this, you know, I'm your teacher and here are the rules. Imagine hearing, you're a superhero and here are the superpowers that you have. I'm going to help you get better at all of those superpowers this year. Um, and I think if you can start with that mental framework and that mental schema with kids, it can go a long way into sort of giving them the ability to see themselves in different roles or in different lights. Um, and I think that, you know, setting the expectation early can be really powerful. And this is a perfect time of year to do that. I did find another of the questions. In regards to the wondering superpower, could this be applied to a general subject? currently being learned, especially since there never seems to be enough time in, in class? Oh, absolutely. You know, that's a really good point. You know, Hedley and I talked extensively as we were creating some of these learning experiences. And we felt that, you know, really the crux of it is this has to go along with what you're already doing. This can't be an add-on or a separate. So, you know, maybe the, your first unit of the year has to do with, you know, I don't know, you know, nature and butterflies, whatever. Um, that used to be my, one of my first units when I was teaching kindergarten. And I think that you could easily layer the wondering superpower and the curating superpower over top of that information that you're already responsible for. So we actually see this as a way to sort of pair what you're already doing with sort of a powerful framework that can actually carry kids throughout the entire year so that as you go from unit to unit, and as you continue to revisit these superpowers, there are really common threads 
that kids start to see and understand um, through the instructional process. Because the more that we can be explicit about what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, the better kids can actually learn, move forward, and become empowered in individuals themselves. And I so I, I also see the question here about badges. Um, I think that you know we we love badges and we use them sort of in a flexible way. You'll notice that all of the superpower icons can actually be repurposed as badges. Um, and you know I I think that the, the thing you have to be careful about is ensuring that you don't create sort of a a system or model of just complete extrinsic motivation. Um, but I think that when those those badges become something that kids can reflect on and kids can actually see their progress, it can become really, really powerful. So one of the things that Hadley and I have played with is this idea of having badges on a slider um, and actually after an activity or after a unit, having kids sort of self-assess how they use those those competencies or those badges or how strong they were in that superpower or how weak they were um, to really, you know, own those and to really think that this is sort of uh, something that's in development over time. You don't just earn it and then it goes away. It's something that you're constantly revisiting. One of the things that it's really, can you hear me? Um, one of the things that it's really important for us um, is that students can name what it is, what their power is and that they're developing so that when they, um, uh, you know, so that they are the ones saying, I'm getting better at this superpower, that it's not about a teacher supplying the A in curating. It's about the student saying, oh, here are the steps that I wanted to, the power that I wanted to gain, and am I gaining that here? And so after the lessons have been taught, then they can continue to self-assess as to whether or not they're, um, they, they have earned another badge in curating or whether they want to wait for another badge. But um, in my classroom, the badges are much more about them supplying the badges to themselves than it is about me awarding them um, because I don't want it to be uh, similar to giving the A, B, or C. I want it to be about them saying, I'm getting better at this. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid the spandex. Uh, oh. Sorry, go, Kristen. I was going to say, um, you know, Stephanie, I think you raise a really good question about explicit instruction and sort of working on these powers. Um, I think that, you know, that's going to depend on your kids and what your kids need. Um, you know, obviously, at some point, you're going to have to give kids a little bit of explicit instruction so that they have the skills and tools that they need to be successful. My, my, my caution to you or sort of a, a moment of pause is something that Grant Wiggins always says. He always says, is it just in case learning or is it just in time learning? And so I think that as long as the explicit instruction is just in time in that it's when kids are naturally curious because they don't know how to get to the next step of a really meaningful project, uh, project that's when explicit instruction makes sense and when explicit instruction works. Um, when we're talking about, you know, we're going to give you all of this information up front just because you might need it when you get down the line, that's when it really starts to become in our minds um, less effective. So hopefully that if you ask yourself that question, is this experience just in case or just in time, that can help you determine is it something that is, is necessary given that point that you're at in the learning process. The other thing that I've found is that as I've been looking at the, the arc of my year, that the wondering superpower has a lot to do with we're starting a unit at the beginning of the year and I want them to engage with that topic. And so working on how do I ask questions, how do I think about this topic fits in there in a way that I would have done other sort of activities like that, but teaching them to begin to ask questions and begin to push their thinking is, is an important skill. When I look later, in, you know, later on in the fall and they're starting to do the, their first research project, that's when I would be introducing a curating superpower so that it's going in line with what I have to teach them anyway, but it's pausing a moment to make sure that they're aware that there's a specific um, critical skill that they're learning. 
Um, and so when they start their research, they'd be doing their wondering superpower to start with, and then they'd be doing their curating superpower after that. Wow, thank you for these awesome resources on badging. They look fantastic. We have some rock stars in the house. That's a good question, Peggy. How do you inspire wondering if it has been crushed out of them? Like later on in, in school years? You know, it's funny. If you think about um, students who are so engaged and absolutely love school, usually the first image that comes to your mind is a five-year-old or a six-year-old. And when you think about students who tend to be disengaged, um, they tend to be further along in their, their school experience. And if you really think about that, what is the common denominator there that has sort of caused that to happen is school. Um, so I think that the second that you can communicate to kids that this learning is going to be for real, it's for keeps, um, and it is going to be different, and um, this, you know, I am your guide here. There's a strong relationship between my role and your role and how we're actually going to work together. And my job isn't necessarily to judge you, but it's to help you. Um, that can start that process. But I think we would all be fooling ourselves if, if there, we thought that there was a magical bullet or a silver bullet to sort of sh make that shift. I think that you're going to have to sort of um, earn that back from kids, you know, lesson by lesson as you truly put them in control. And, you know, it can be a little bit uncomfortable um, at the beginning. It can be a little bit uncomfortable to, you know, for students themselves when, when they go, I'm really in charge here. No, no, no. Aren't you going to tell me what I should be doing? Um, and I think that once kids actually get over that, um, that's when you really start to see the excitement. And it's well worth those, you know, few hours or days of, of discomfort. I think it's also really important at the beginning of the year to have activities that are no stakes activities. Um, there are things that you can do with them that will let them realize that they are safe in your classroom and that they can have fun doing things. National Geographic has awesome wall maps that you can download and they're, you know, sort of, oh, maybe eight feet by eight feet and all in computer sized paper and putting together maps. Or Bill Ferreter has a mystery game that he ha where you have to collaborate to figure out the, the solution to the mystery. Just doing things with kids where when they come into your classroom, they know that they're safe and they know that it's going, they are going to be respected and they're going to be actually learning um, can, can create a whole different environment because so often they're used to going in and the first thing that happens is they get told a list of rules and they get told to sort of how to, how to sit in their box while they're there. And if we can let them out of their box, if we can do things with them that are connected to our, to our subject matter, but at the same time are allowing them to, to work together and to, to enjoy being a learner, then I think it goes a long way to helping them to, to move beyond just wanting to know how do I get the A to what's going to happen in class today I, you know, I, and to try to, to sort of look forward to, to walking through the door of your classroom because they don't know what they're going to find on the other side. My kids are always saying to me they, that they are always surprised because I change my desks around Oh, every couple of days, because it depends on what the activity is as to whether or not they're sitting by themselves, they're sitting in groups, and every day they walk in and they're like, oh my heavens. Um, but I think that that sort of thing is important because they enter the room saying, what's going to happen today? And it makes them feel like they, like they matter and that they're going to gain power here. Terrific, Hadley and Kristen. Unless there are more questions, I've captured the few that were in chat, and I know Kristen and Hadley were also capturing them themselves as they went along. Um, we're probably about time to wrap up today's show, and I will turn the mic over to Peggy. 
that was such a great presentation, and it's so inspiring to have a way to kind of wrap your head around all of those ideas. And I know that we have so many rock stars right here in this room that all of you could, if you would, uh, keep sharing the resources you're using to help your students learn that they really do have these superpowers and you want them to be using them. So thank you so much, Kristen and Hadley, for jump-starting this for all of us. We have some excellent shows coming up on Classroom 2O Live. We always meet on Saturdays this same time. But if you can't make a live show, please know that they're always recorded and you'll be able to access them either on our website or on YouTube or iTunes U. You can subscribe to both of those. So next week, we have Kyle Pierce joining us. He's an amazing teacher. He's a tech integration specialist, but he's also a middle school math teacher. And he's a coach and curriculum developer in one-to-one -one environments. So we're really looking forward to hearing from him. And then on August 16th, Paul Bogush will be joining us, and his blog is called Blogush. And so we always make that mistake of calling him Paul Blogush, but that's not his real name. We're thrilled to have him joining us. And um, we haven't finalized the guest for August 23rd. We won't have a show on the Labor Day holiday, but we have another great inspiring presenter coming on September 6th, and that is Joan Young. For those of you who know her, she is just an amazing educator. She has written a book called Encouragement in the Classroom, and she's going to be sharing tons of strategies for how you can do that, which will be a fabulous follow-up on today's show. And then on September 13th, we're going to have a great Live Binder show. Karma Yancey won one of the top 10 ePortfolio Live Binders this year. And she's going to share a bunch of her student examples of what they created as their digital portfolios as they were exploring careers. So I know that you're going to want to see that and get access to all of those live binders so you can use them in your classrooms. Also, don't forget that the Learning Revolution is a great place to sign up for the newsletters. You'll get a weekly email blast that tells you about all the upcoming virtual conferences, uh, webinars, all things related to ed tech. That is hosted by Steve Hargadon, and it is just a fabulous resource. Also, I know lots of you are interested in Edmodocon. Edmodo first, and know that Edmodocon is coming. This is a fabulous conference. It's just one day. It's totally free, and it's all about Edmodo. It's August 6th, so it's coming up, I think, I think that's a Tuesday. Um, and um, they share so many great practical ways to use Edmodo in your classroom. You'll be hearing from the teachers who use it every day. So check that out. Go to edmodocon.com and subscribe to their blog for updates so you know new things that are coming out there. The closing keynote that day is going to be great. Steve Dembo is doing shining a spotlight on our schools, making students the star of the show. So I know that's going to be wonderful. Also, the homeschool conference is coming up. And it's not really just about homeschooling, but it's about anything related to education, possibly outside of a traditional public school. You're welcome to join. It's free. It lasts two days, August 7th and 8th. And along with that, they're hosting an alternative ed film festival. And that is a place where you can see some really current full-length 
videos related to education and especially alternative ways of learning and schooling. And those will all be recorded in online so you can log in whenever you like. But if you log in at the schedule time, you get to meet with the director of the film, which is very, very cool. Also, I'm going to turn this back over to Lori, and I'll add a few links in the chat about the things I've just mentioned, and she can tell you all about nominating a featured teacher. Thanks, Peggy. Yes, you can follow this link, or the, the, the link to the form at this tiny URL site, uh, CR20Live Featured Teacher Nominate, without the E at the end. Uh, to nominate a featured teacher, each month we have a featured teacher for the month. And it helps celebrate classroom teachers. And Peggy's posted the link in chat. You can nominate yourself as well for that. When you exit today's show, your browser should open the link for the survey. And here's the direct link for the survey, tinyurl.com slash cr20live survey. Or you can take the link from the chat which Peggy has just placed. Or you can also get the link from the live binder for today's show. Sometimes the survey doesn't open directly when you exit the room. When you do take the survey, at the bottom is a place to request the professional development certificate. Please use a personal email for the certificate to be sent rather than a school email address. Most, a lot of the time, schools will block this email from arriving, and you won't get the survey. Uh, that's at the bottom, or the, the certificate. That's at the bottom of the survey. Like Peggy said, the audio collection and video collection are both on live I, or iTunes U. Uh, you can subscribe to one or both of these and get the recordings for video and or audio. Also, there is an RSS feed for show archives on the Classroom 2.0 Live site that you can set up in a feed reader. So you get the show that way as well. So there are many, many different ways to, to access the show archives. Again, special thanks today to Kristen Swanson and Hadley Ferguson for being our special guests, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our site, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs>